After an introduction like that, if I were smart, I'd just go home and cry. <laughs> I mean, how do you thank so many people? How do you thank a wife like Melinda, my children like Katrina, Ashley, John, Wendy? How do you thank a family that fought so hard and worked so hard to allow you to come from the streets of Rochester, New York, and to do some of the things that are ascribed to me. So I thank you for all of that. And I thank the Alliance, especially. I didn't anticipate they're talking so much about me. I just hoped that, that we were going to talk together about a situation that now confronts our country and that all of us have to face in a very dramatic way. I first of all want to thank Matilda Cuomo for being here tonight. She is the guardian angel of the Four Freedoms Park. She's the one who looks down from her terrace every day and then calls me and tells me how many trees have to be shaved or what else has to be done. She is just the most wonderful person in the world, a heart filled with love and compassion. She's brought, she's helped with two men who have affected deeply the destiny of our state and of our nation. And we think of Mario, and we think of Andrew tonight, and we think of the thousands of grandchildren and others that Matilda has really inspired all her life. Thank you, Matilda, for being here. And I want to thank Ann Roosevelt. I've been associated all my life, practically, with the Roosevelts. From a kid in Rochester, New York, handing out leaflets in the Wilkie election, to taking my mother to meet Eleanor Roosevelt and I am an American Day, and understanding from the earliest years of my life what it meant to be an American, because my parents had been immigrants to this country, and they never looked back. It was to give us an education to help us grow. And there isn't a day in my life that I don't think of them. And in many ways, think of all of you who've played such an extraordinary role in helping me in these great projects. But Anne Roosevelt, this granddaughter of Franklin and Eleanor, has carried forth their legacy and their values and has inspired and led new generations to know the meaning of the Roosevelt heritage and the four freedoms that is at its core. Thank you, Anne. Thank you for being here. And thank you for always being there for the projects we've undertaken together. <clears throat> Nan is a pioneer, a brilliant advocate, a person whose integrity is the guide for all of us. The Alliance for Justice is in large part the result of her boundless energy and her extraordinary commitment to justice and the right of all citizens to have access and confidence in our courts. Nan, I'm here to thank you and the Alliance for what you've accomplished and to say a few words about the momentous crisis that makes the leadership of the Alliance for Justice more urgent than ever. There are friends I have in the room who are Republican, a great friend like Bruce Gelb, for example. I've worked all my life with Democrats and Republicans, never faltering in my commitment to Franklin Roosevelt as the greatest president our country's had. I say that because this is a crisis, as Norm has indicated, that really requires each of us and all of us to look into our hearts and to decide again what kind of a country this is. Election night a year ago was an anguished experience for many of us. We were on the cusp of historic events. The first woman president succeeding our first African-American president who had won two terms and was leaving that high office intact with accomplishment, with dignity, and international respect. And then, the lightning and the thunder. It was over. The inexplicable vagaries of politics 
brought a very different result. A government which mocked experience took power. The victors rejoiced in their unexpected triumph. And in the weeks that followed, we watched as the Know Nothing movement of a century ago took over. The true shock was the completeness of our defeat. We had lost the presidency, the, both houses of the Congress, and a majority in the Supreme Court. And that, all that, that we had fought for was in jeopardy. The sinister echo of racial justice that had torn this country apart so many times was heard again. Extraordinary progress in economic growth and the creation of jobs was pushed aside as though our recovery from the Great Recession was accomplished by the very people who caused it. The American international leadership, the achievement of three generations of bipartisan support was pushed aside as the world in disbelief watched as the Americans, as the United States, dumped our commitments into a sewer of suspicion, hostile words, insults for our friends and our allies, and hateful and foolhardy challenges to those who wish to do us harm. At the center of this earthquake was a group of men who understood that with this moment had given them their priority above all is to seize control of the judiciary. Their intention is to build a majority that will last 30 years by making radical appointments that were already vetted and waiting in the wings. I speak of working together for three generations in our international commitments. I think of General Donovan, William J. Donovan, a great Republican, a great American, holder of every medal this country ever awarded, and how successfully he worked with President Roosevelt and with so many other people to accomplish the great purposes of the OSS. I think of Jack Javits, who was my law partner, a great and successful man who fought so hard in the streets of New York and came to be regarded as the most powerful intellect in the Senate. I could mention a hundred more that each of us have worked with. Today we speak to all of them as Republicans and Democrats and ask to see what we're doing. We've had time now to absorb and witness the significance of the election. The victors, unimpeded by knowledge or interest in history, are moving forward and making the judiciary. Arthur Schlesinger, a dear friend and the preeminent historian of our time, said in an earlier time of crisis, history is to a nation as memory is to the individual. As persons deprived of memory become disoriented, not knowing where they've been or where they're going, so a nation lacking the conception of the past, will be disabled in dealing with its present and with its future. In that context, the court reorganization proposals in 1937 by President Franklin Roosevelt are relevant. The enemies of the New Deal had started thousands of litigations to stop the fulfillments of the program which the President had initiated, and which the Congress had legislated, and which Americans in landslide elections had approved. The court's majority, appointed by FDR's predecessors, determined to block the New Deal. It proceeded to overturn legislation that the President and the Congress had enacted to solve the desperate crisis of the Great Depression. 36, FDR was elected by an overwhelming landslide, a mandate that no other president of the United States had ever had. The court then, in response, reached even further to limit the government's power by ruling unconstitutional, for example, state legislation establishing minimum wages, outlawing child labor, regulating the hours and working conditions affecting women. The court was about to decide the constitutionality, 
of the Social Security Act. We think and reflect on the moment what the Social Security Act has meant in the last 60 years in our country. And of the Wagner Act, which was protecting the rights of labor to organize. The expectation in legal circles, following what they had done before, was that the court would rule these programs unconstitutional. It was a dramatic moment in the history of America. Would the social and economic revolution enacted by the elected representatives of the people die? Defeated not at the polls, by a, but in a court whose majority philosophy the people had soundly, soundly repudiated? Roosevelt respected the constitutional framework of balance of power and the judiciary as an independent branch of government. But he stood with Abraham Lincoln and with Theodore Roosevelt in rejecting the concept that the Constitution was a rigid, inflexible document that could prevent the government from responding to crises that threatened to destroy the nation. FDR proposed that the president be empowered to appoint a new justice for every justice who reached the age of 70 and who decided to stay on the bench as a senior justice. There was a precedent for doing that, but after bitter debate, the president's proposals relating to the Supreme Court were not adopted. But Roosevelt's challenge had forced the court to reconsider its constitutional obligations. The court proceeded, reversed its direction, upheld the Social Security Act and the Wagner Act, and even reversed the decision on legislation that had ruled unconstitutional just months before. What is the lesson of all of this for us? We must understand that the aim of those now exercising government power is to create a Supreme Court that will make progressive initiatives more difficult and in fact impossible for at least the next 30 years. And further, to reverse as much as possible of the post-1933 landmark efforts to build a nation reflecting liberal democracy. The struggle for constitutional integrity and the Bill of Rights is never over. Newt Gingrich, the former Republican Speaker of the House, who, by the way, is a great admirer of Franklin Roosevelt as a political leader, told the Heritage Foundation recently that the opportunity to finally defeat, uh, to finally repeat Franklin Roosevelt had arrived. The time to defeat Franklin Roosevelt had arrived. We missed two prior occasions, he said, but this time we have the power and the complete power, and we're going to use it. How secure are the historical, historic rulings in the areas of civil rights, civil justice, racial justice, women's liberation, labor's rights? What will contain their constant assault on the First Amendment, on the fundamental principle of separation of church and state, on civilian control of the military, all basic and fundamental problems that reach to the beginning of our country but who hold the essence of what we mean as a nation. We are reminded that Roosevelt's battle, that the Supreme Court is a supremely undemocratic institution. It is appointed, not elected, for life terms. Neither the court nor its members are accountable to anybody. And at the very least, this should oblige an attitude of restraint through self-restraint. Abraham Lincoln defined our constitutional dilemma in his first inaugural address. If the policy of our government, said Lincoln, if the policy of our government upon vital questions affecting the whole people is to be irrevocably fixed by the decisions of the Supreme Court, the people will have ceased to be their own rulers. We know what is happening now. Frustrated by the unprecedented failure of their own party to prevail in Congress, concerned by the historic lows of the President's popular approval, the administration has chosen the courts to be the place 
to exercise their plenary power, and in the process, reveal their threatening vision of America. It is the obligation of both parties to honor the constitutional integrity of the courts, to recognize the historic obligation to foster the unity of our nation, to command respect for the court's authority by demanding judicial nominees whose fairness, experience, and commitment to a well-ordered society are beyond question. Integrity and character are the basic qualities to be sought in judicial candidates. We look to men and women who understand that at the moment of their oath, they are transformed into a special role, that they have become guardians of democracy and their partisanship must be left behind. They are no longer trumpets of their own opinions, but must be respectful of history, open-minded to argument and opinion, incorruptible in the exercise of their power. Perfection is not our expectation but respect for the hopes and aspirations of all our people is our demand. The Alliance for Progress has a critical role to play in this forthcoming debate, in this titanic struggle that is now underway. Politically, we are at a powerful disadvantage because the elections in New Jersey and countless elections for state and local positions across the country have happily begun to transform the battlefield. And when a million women marched on Washington, we remembered what a democracy aroused can do. Americans motivated and united can change the world. The swamp of money has to be drained. Its toxic influence on our institutions corrupts our democracy. And the day will come, I am certain, when another president takes that office and Citizens United will be a bad memory and the brilliant descent of Paul Stevens will prevail. Congratulations, Nan, on what you and your colleagues have done. Now begins the long march. Step by step, we must reclaim the ground that we have lost and move on to support a judiciary of which all Americans can be proud. We must be led again by citizens of the Republic who see leadership as a noble cause, defined not by personal ambition, but by morality and a call to service. And then, on those days when you and all of us need to find new energy and we're at the end of our rope do as Franklin Roosevelt suggested. When you get to the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. <laughs> and then after you've tied that knot, take a tram to Freedom R Roosevelt Island, to Freedom Park, to the Four Freedoms Park, a memorial designed by Louis Kahn. And there, midst its glorious spiritual beauty. Close your eyes and listen, and listen, and listen, and your soul will be lifted as you hear happy days will come again. We will sing a song of cheer again. Happy days will come again. All together shout it out. There's no one who can doubt. So let's tell the world about it now. Happy days will come again. Your cares and troubles are gone. There will be no more.
for from no one. Happy days are here again. The skies above will fill you again. We will sing a song of cheer again. Happy days will come again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for a wonderful life.